Good morning and welcome to the 27th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members accessing papers through electronic devices should please ensure that they're turned to silent. This morning, we return to the committee's art funding inquiry. The purpose of this session is to consider comparative approaches uh, to the funding of the arts uh, and building on the research that we commissioned earlier in the year from Drew Wiley. I'd like to welcome our panel of witnesses this morning. Orla McBride, uh, the director of the Arts Council Ireland, uh, in Coeur Olin and Agnesa Moody, the Director of Creative Europe. Um, we've received apologies from the Chief Executive of Arts Council England, Dr Darren Henley, OBE. Uh, he was originally confirmed to give evidence at today's meeting, but he has declined due to the rules of PURDA being in place ahead of the upcoming UK general election. Um, I'd like to start uh, perhaps by um, ad addressing my initial questions to, to Orla. Um, a large amount of the time for our inquiry has been looking at how, how we best support individual artists and creative practitioners uh, in Scotland. Um, and we've obviously, through Drew Wiley, um, we're very interested in, in how you do that in Ireland. Perhaps um, for the purposes of, of the record, you could tell us a little bit more about how the Arts Council in Ireland supports the living conditions of artists, including fair pay, and if you were able to demonstrate how that happens throughout an artist's career. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, one of the key objectives of our strategy is to support the individual artist. Um, and we do that in two ways. We do it through supporting organisations. Uh, so no gallery, no theatre, no art centre exists without art as being in some way connected into the creation of work. Um, so all of the work, all of the funding that we give to organisations, obviously artists are included in that. Um, but we also support individual artists directly. Um, and a significant proportion of our funding um, is specifically earmarked for individual artists. They apply individually to the Arts Council for a number of, of uh, bursaries um, and different schemes and projects that are led by individual artists. Um, and they also then, uh, we have a scheme called Ace Donna, uh, which is for creative artists, and that is a national um, programme uh, that was introduced by the government in 1981. And for 250 artists are members of Ace Donna at any one time, all of them can receive what is known as the CNUAS, uh, which is a stipend, a grant, from the Arts Council by virtue of their membership of AS Donna. So to be a member of AS Donna, you must have a body of work behind you. So it's not one novel or one book of poetry. It is a body of work. So it's mostly artists mid-career. Um, and um, they receive a stipend of €17,180 per annum. And that allows them to take time to pursue their practice without having to teach part-time or wait tables or, or find other work. So it's about really recognising that artists need time to pursue their practice um, and that that allows them the time. Um, they're also then, obviously, they can, um, they can earn money from their creative output. It's not so easy to earn money as an artist, um, particularly an individual artist, but they can earn up to €25,000 on top of their, their, their canoeus of 17000 so it's really about trying that we support artists um, by giving them a base funding that allows them then the comfort really to pursue their practice. So now that is only for 250 artists. So when you ask me to talk about the arc of an artist's career, they would be for mid, uh, mid artists going up to, to older artists. And then we have a lot of um, support specifically for artists at the early stages of their careers. So we have one particular scheme um, um, that's called Next Generation, um, and that would be for artists that wouldn't have a huge body of work behind them, but have established themselves and made a very firm commitment to pursuing their practice professionally. Um, and we would fund uh, uh, emerging artists up to €20,000 for a year um, that allows them, and it, it's, a, it's at a very early stage in their career. So those would be the kinds of supports. We would support about 600 individual artists on an annual basis through both the CNUAS and then through a range of other schemes and awards. And all of the decisions as they relate to supporting individual artists are made by peer panels. 
So it's peer assessment. So it is not the Arts Council sitting, making decisions about individual artists. It is the pe it's your peers. Um, it's people from your own art form um, and at the same stage in, in the career as you are who are making decisions um, in relation to the allocation of the funding to the individuals. Thank you. And I know that other members will have questions about, about peer review uh, later on, like, because that's very much a subject of our inquiry as well. Uh, in terms of the, what you're saying about the schemes for individual artists, understand the stipends uh, for um, the mid-career established artists. But for the, for the other uh, funding streams, is that on a project-by-project -project basis, um, so that they have to justify what the money's being spent on? Yes, it, well, it depends whether they're applying for a bursary, which is really about time. It's buying time. So we fund the buying of time, in effect. Um, and the majority of bursaries will be about the €20,000 per annum. Um, and that, as I say, is about buying time. Or it could be a project where they come to us with a particular artistic idea um, and they want, they want that funded if they're a visual artist or they're, they're a theatre practitioner or they're a dance artist. So it depends really on what, what the artist, if they want to create a piece of work, um, it may be that they apply for a project, but if they want time to pursue an idea, then that would be a bursary. How many bursaries do you give out in a year? Uh, we would give out pr about three or four hundred. Right, that's quite, yeah. it's quite a significant quite, It is number. quite significant. Um, and, um, yeah, as I say, the average would be about 20,000 uh, per annum. And people can apply, you know, for multi-annual bursaries as well. So it might be that this year I want to pursue a particular idea and then next year I want to actually bring that idea to life. Right. Um, so, so, yes. Um, however, I have to say that... Um, we will never be able to meet the level of demand. Um, no. So, um, and that's a conversation we have with third level institutions all the time because, you know, there needs to be a circularity between the number of, of younger people that are coming through third level institutions and then the expectation to be able to pursue a career that's really difficult. It's really hard to be an artist in Ireland, and I'm sure it's exactly the same in Scotland. It's really hard to pursue a career in, 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 in the arts. We, in terms of individual artists and uh, bursaries and projects for individual artists, we can only ever meet, I think the, the, the last year's statistics, the 2018, was 27%. So right. of the level of, of, of application that we receive, we can only meet about 27% of the... And I take it if you get a bursary, is it a one-off or could you get a bursary oh, can... over a number of years? Oh, no, you can keep... You yeah, can. absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, but it's, it, as I say, it's really very difficult. You asked me earlier about the living and working conditions of artists um, and that has that is and continues to be a huge issue. Um, the average artist would earn about seven or eight thousand euro per annum uh, from their artistic output, which isn't a lot. No. Um, uh, so we have now, um, and we're signing off on a new policy, um, which will be a national policy and all cultural institutions will have to, buy, uh, to sign up to it, um, which will be endorsed at, 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 at ministerial level, which will be a new policy um, on the remuneration of artists. Um, and, and for us, we can look after artists when they're applying to us. We know that 20,000 is a fair amount of money to give an individual artist for a year to allow them to pursue their practice. But we need to ensure that when we fund a theatre or we fund a gallery or we fund a, a publishing press, that they're actually paying artists proper fees. Um, so that is now tied in as a funding condition to our, our um, funding agreements with arts organisations that they have to demonstrate to us uh, the fee structure that they pay to artists um, and we will condition their funding accordingly. So if we see that there are organisations in receipt of Arts Council funding that are that are behaving, you know, they're, they're delinquent in their responsibilities to, 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 to pay artists properly, then we will um, uh, withhold money or we will condition their funding accordingly. Right, okay, that's interesting. And, and very quickly, because I want to move on to Agnesa as well, um, how, how do you ensure that you, or, or do you ensure that you award bursaries across a variety of art forms? How strategically do you do that? So we have art form bursaries. So right. if I'm an artist, I will apply for either a visual arts bursary or a literature bursary or a theatre bursary or a dance bursary. Right. And we allocate it across so that every art form would have mm. a, 
uh, would have their, uh, their 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 amount of money that they allocate and towards And does one art rates. form get more emphasis than another? You might say all oh, theatre or whatever is particularly yes, strong uh, in Ireland, so we're going to focus on that. Uh, not so much that's really strong in Ireland, so we're going to focus on it. It's mostly recognising that um, if you're a creative artist, so you're a writer or you're a visual artist, that um, those kind of more individual art forms, more individualistic art forms rather than collaborative art forms that we might see dance or theatre where you need a group of people in a room to create something. That I've, if I'm a writer or I'm a visual artist, the chances are I am pursuing my practice individually. So therefore there would be more put into literature or put into the visual arts, recognising that there are more individual artists in those art forms, whereas in dance or theatre it's much more collaborative. Okay. Thanks very much. And if I could turn to Agnieszka, um, what, what kind of funding opportunities are available to artists through the Creative Europe programme? And do you differentiate between artists at different stages of the, their career as well? Okay, so um, perhaps first I should define really what my role is. Um, the Creative Europe is the European Union's only program, funding program, cooperation program, which is devoted to Europe's cultural, creative and audiovisual sectors. It's, it's the pan-European program um, that uh, has a budget of 1.46 billion euros over seven year period. And the current edition lasts until the end of 2020. The, the feature of this program is that um, it has what we call desks in every country, Creative Europe desks, which are information and promotion points for the program, which itself is administered from Brussels centrally for all participating countries. So in, at the European Commission, there, there's a policy team that is looking at the delivery of the strategic aims of the program and its evaluation and budget. And then there's executive agency that is responsible for administering um, the funding. So they uh, come up with the guidelines, application <coughs> forms, and the applications are also sent to them. Uh, the work of the agency is assisted by the um, rather vast pool of uh, industry and sector experts. So it's very similar to what my colleague was saying about uh, peer assessment that also applies in Creative Europe with international dimension um, written into it. And then the role of the desks is this sort of bridging device between the sector in any particular country and this sort of centre in Brussels. Because Brussels might be a faraway place for lots of cultural operators. We, the desks, are devoted to looking after the sector in our country. So in the UK, I had the team, I head the team uh, of Creative Europe Desk UK, which is a partnership between um, British Film Institute, where I work, British Council, Creative Scotland, Welsh Government and Arts Council England. These are our partners. We are designated by the DCMS to deliver promotion and information awareness raising on, on, on the program in the UK. So I just wanted to make that distinction that um, Creative Europe itself is administered out of Brussels, but in every country there's an office such as the one that I lead. Okay. Um, there was a question about artists and when, when are they supported in their careers. I think it's not, um, it's, it's any, any time that they need to be supported. There's a lot of support for young and emerging talent, uh, but it doesn't mean that people at different stages of their careers cannot be supported. Um, what's important to understand about the Creative Europe is that it has a set of clearly defined objectives and any application that comes for funding to this program has to um, satisfy those objectives. So artists and cultural operators might think of a great variety of different exciting projects they might want to embark on, but in order to get funding, those projects would have to be aligned well with the objectives. And the objectives are quite smart because there's a very interesting tension between them. The two main objectives of Creative Europe are almost pulling in opposite directions because one of them is to safeguard and promote the cultural diversity in Europe, including 
linguistic diversity and promotion of their cultural heritage. And then equally important is the objective of competitiveness. So it's more of an industrial agenda. It's about strengthening the sector, which is already performing rather well, similarly to the UK narrative that creative industries are the sector which is growing faster than other sectors and is worth investment because it's, it's future-facing and it's um, contributing to all those societal issues that we so badly need solutions for. So all, that, all, all those narratives are very well aligned between the UK and, and, and the EU. And the programme is trying to achieve on both. So in any project there will be a different sort of, um, if you look at it at the, as a spectrum, some will be more kind of industrious in their uh, ambitions and some will be more focused on, on diversity. But it will always be somewhere on that line. So any application, any project that comes to, to Creative Europe would have to bear in mind also the sort of well-being of the sector rather than just the individual project. How this project contributes to strengthening the cultural sector where I am, in my sort of locality, okay. and with international dimension. Okay, okay thanks very much. I Stuart, did you have a supplementary on this topic? Yes, yeah, yes. yes thank you. It's uh, towards uh, Orla. Um, and you mentioned earlier that uh, some people can uh, obtain multiple bursaries. Uh, has there been any tension with that? Because you also mentioned that uh, the application the applications accepted are 27%. Is there then a possibility that if people are getting the multiple applications and, and multiple bursaries, that some people who are trying to break into the sector are not getting uh, some uh, some of the bursaries. No, and it's a very legitimate question. Yeah, we call them we call them serial applicants. Um, so yes, on I'd, it's really it's really difficult for any funding agency. An artist is not going to get a bursary one year and then for the rest of their life they can sustain a career as an artist. So we have to recognise that people will be coming back again and again and again. So all you can do is you know introduce that you can't get two in two successive years. So they those would be the only ways in which we can um, we can ensure that there is that distribution so that new entrants are coming through. But ultimately for us it's about trying to get extra money from government so that we can actually increase the 27% to, 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 to four. I mean there will always be a competitive edge and there has to be a competitive edge when it comes to public funding. But the reality is we just don't have enough money to put in. If we had more money then there is nothing wrong with an artist being successful in making an application. If they weren't successful, if, if their practice wasn't good, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be successful in, in, in the application process. So, but we can't penalise them for success either. It's our job as, 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 as public agencies to try and, and, and increase our resources or increase the, 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 the allocation that we put into individual artists so that, that we can increase from 27 to 37 to 47. So we shouldn't be penalising artists because we are underfunded as a public agency. So it's a really delicate one and we're never ever going to solve it. So all we can do is say, well, you can't apply two years in a row or, you know, you can put those kind of um, uh, eligibility checks in place. But it's really, really difficult. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. I'm interested in Orla's last comments and wondered when it comes to the Irish government, if the funding that the Art Council receives, if it has remained stable in recent years or if it's increased or decreased, and if there's a percentage figure you could give for how much, do you know the share of the budget you get, how much that is overall of the Irish government's budget? Um, so, no different to any other um, country in recent years, we suffered you know, quite a significant recession um, and our funding dropped um, from 85 million euro in um, 20, or 2008 to the lowest point, which was 55 million um, in 2013. And we're back up now to 80 million. Um, and and that, that increase really happened from 2016 onwards. Uh, so in those middle years, we were literally just trying to keep the doors open and the lights on. Um, and there was no... But, but, but in those intervening years, it allowed us to radically change the way in which we do, did business. Um, and, you know, there was a complete paradigm shift in terms of how we saw ourselves as an organisation. And we went through a major transformation. Um, you know, as they say... 
you know, a good crisis can give rise to, to, to opportunity. Um, so, so we changed completely the way in which we do business as a, as a public agency. Um, so, so the increase has happened just as we have, have changed course um, in terms of, of, of our direction as, as, as a public agency and um, becoming much more developmental in our approach, being much more evidence-based. Organisations apply to the Arts Council for funding to support the Arts Council to deliver on our remit and on our strategic objectives rather than this passive funding that I want to do A, B and C, here's the money, now off you go and do A, B and C, that actually it has to be a much more engaged relationship between arts organisations and the Arts Council. Um, in terms of, there are many statistics in terms of the, um, the percentage of GDP that is allocated to the arts and culture in any country. There are European statistics, um, and often we're at a loss as to how those are calculated. Um, there are statistics at a national level, um, but they comprehend the entire culture spend, not just the spend on the Arts Council, for example. So all of our public, uh, our museums, our galleries, um, those na national cultural institutions are all comprehended within that. So it's really difficult for me to say what percentage really of, 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 of spend, but it's about 0.6%. Yeah, yeah, so there's no percentage the government claims and there's no, no, no target set yeah, around. No. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. it's because it's really difficult. Yeah. There are different metrics that are used at a European level to, to the metrics that are used at a domestic level. Um, but uh, So we are now back up at, at 80 million, so we're almost where we were in 2008. But that's, I, and I hate when people say, oh, our funding isn't back to what it was. We need to be, think very differently about funding. So when organisations apply to us and say, you know, return us to our 2008 levels of funding, we kind of go, no, actually, we all have to do things differently now. Things have changed utterly. Mm -hmm. um, but we're back up at 80 million. Okay. And as a public agency, um, because you... So, in, in answer to the previous question, describe yeah. a situation where there's more pool and resources than what you currently have, and that you are underfunded by the, the government, given the caveats you've already explained about yes. the financial overall picture. Um, so, as an organisation, do you see yourself as an organisation which lobbies the government and calls for more public no. funding? For no, the we arts? can't. No. We're a public agency. We're, 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 we're a government agency. We're a state agency. I cannot, you know, I cannot lobby my my minister because I am I, I am an employee effectively of the government. I'm a public servant. Um, but what we can do is very clearly demonstrate um, the impact of that investment. Um, so therefore government can very clearly see that more investment in the Arts Council will yield more for for, for, for the taxpayer, will yield more for the Irish public. Um, but also to very clearly demonstrate that those percentages. So if we can only fund 27% of the number of artists that are applying to us for support, then look at the swathes of artists that are that are struggling to make a living in our, in Ireland, and yet we claim to be a country that that values and nurtures and supports artists. Mm -hmm. So it's about presenting the arguments in a very clear way um, with robust analysis, um, and that's all we can do. But we cannot become we cannot come out publicly and, and, and that, lobby that still government. sounds like quite a lot, and sounds like you're you could, you make a robust case yes. for what you're able to deliver and what the potential there is. Um, if I move on to relationship with local authorities, yes. um, so you have uh, in the papers that were provided to us quite a yes. close working relationship yes. with local authorities and I wondered if there was any within that any expectation or target or percentage set for local authorities in terms of how much they spend on culture in their budgets or is that discussion is that a more open discussion or is there a target or an expectation or yeah so we would see local authorities as probably being our most important strategic partner um ireland is a very uh, dispersed country uh, it's quite a rural um population so it is very difficult for a national agency that's sitting in dublin to reach every community in the country and yet we have a responsibility to do so uh, so our relationship with local government ensures that we that we can can at least balance um, our approach in terms of, of, of uh, support across the country. Um, we would say that our relationship with local authorities started in 1985 when um, the Arts Council funded the first arts officer in a local authority. 
um, and we funded the post. And now every local authority in the country has an arts officer. And do you still fund those posts? Not anymore. No, no. that's funded. By so local that is, a, but it evolved. And it's uh -huh. a thir you know, it's a 35-year relationship, and it's probably only in the last 15 years that we've ceased to fund those positions because they've been mainstreamed within the local authorities. And local authorities have retained them. Yes. So that's been um, during the the before the the recession during the boom years they would have built up those those um, teams within local authorities to maybe having um, a, a youth arts officer and maybe having a public arts officer an arts and health coordinator so the teams would have been developed but then um, as the recession hit really they went back to the skeletal staff that is just the arts officer and um, within every local authority then at a more senior level in terms of senior management there would be a director of culture and that is ensuring that both the arts, heritage, the language, Gaeltacht, all of those um, cultural um, provisions are, are under one directorate within a local authority. And all local authorities would have a director of culture. Yes, all local authorities, yes. Um, uh, provision for the arts is not a statutory service within a local authority. However, provision to have an arts plan is a statutory provision, not within the Local Government Act, but within our, our um, uh, legislation, the Arts Act 2003. So every local authority under the Arts Act 2003 must have an arts plan for their local authority area. And then in terms of, of funding that, uh, so we have, as I said, since uh, 1985, that strategic partnerships. We continue to fund pro, at, pro, at a programmatic level. We continue to fund with local authorities. We fund and they fund. So it's, 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 it should be that we all fund the same amount, but we lost momentum during those 10 years of, of the recession. Um, but we have what we call framework agreements in place with every local authority. So there is, at a national level, um, the county and city management association, so it's the association of all local authorities in the country, um, of which there are 31. Um, and then at an individual, so we have a, an MOU at, at the highest level with the, with the uh, management uh, organisation, and then at an individual level with every local authority we have a framework agreement, and that's signed by me and the, and the chief executive of the local authority, mm -hmm. so it's not signed by the arts officer, so it is very much um, uh, embedded in the work of the local authority, and then we would would fund uh, at a programmatic level and they would fund and we identify those particular elements of the funding agreement that we're interested in and that they're interested in co-funding together because there are areas of responsibility that are very local that the Arts Council as a national agency might not be that interested in but they're really important at a local level. But then there will be some development initiatives, uh, be it work with, with older people, or work in, in very rural communities, or work with young people, or work with you know, disadvantaged communities, mm -hmm. that we would say actually those are particular programmes that we're really interested in because they align to our strategy and we would co-fund those. Uh, so we fund local authorities on an annual basis, um, and that funding is rising, and their funding is rising. And it's a really effective relationship um, and, and I would say it's probably the most important relationship you that we have. You provide funding to local authorities, yes. co-funding within yes. that as an yes. organisation, right? Yes, absolutely. And um, can I just finally ask, in Scotland we have the household survey uh, and that gives us a range of data, but it does give us information on who's participating yes. in the arts. Yes. Does Ireland have a similar model? How do you measure yes. Yes. who is engaging in... Yeah, we have a behaviour and attitudes um, uh, annual survey. And what does that show? And in Scotland, we find that if you live in a more disadvantaged community or you have a long-term health condition or you're older, you're less likely to be engaged in the arts. Is that a similar pattern in yes, Ireland? Yes, absolutely. Do you know? and, yeah. so do you still yeah. have I mean, it is, trying to address it, those issues? Uh, right. And those are the big issues that we have to... How, mm -hmm. how to reach hard reach communities, be those from a demographic perspective, an economic perspective, or a geographic perspective. Those are the big challenges that we have, okay. um, because we're seeing that it's the same people um, you know, that are going to the arts, and, and so in a way, um, those people who, are, who, who, have, who can afford will continue to, to participate. So our role as a, as a public agency is to ensure, and working with local authorities is a way in which we can do that, that there are harder to reach communities. And our role really is to, 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 to work strategically um, on the ground with agencies like, like local government to actually really affect change with those harder to reach communities. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, just I've got a couple of quick questions regarding uh, a scheme called Percentage for Art. 
Uh, I know that it's, uh, it's an operation uh, in Jersey. I know obviously Jersey's not in the EU, uh, but it's, uh, it's a scheme that's been oper operating there for uh, some like, 14 years, and it's been raised with uh, this committee uh, in terms of evidence from uh, certainly a group in my constituency called Rig Arts. Um, is it something that uh, are you aware of this scheme, and it's something that the, that you think would, is useful, and uh, is something you would recommend uh, that, uh, that we uh, introduce in Scotland? So, w if uh, if I understand it, we have the Percent for Art scheme, which is tied into public infrastructure projects. Yes. Is that similar? Yes. Yeah. So, so we have we have that scheme um, in Ireland. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure the committee all know. So where there are public public investment, public infrastructure programmes, that there is a percentage of the overall fee for um, for the the building project, be it a school, be it a road, be it whatever, um, is allocated to um, to the arts, um, to the provision of 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 of. of you know, to, to support some kind of artistic output. Um, in the 80s and the 90s and the, the noughties, um, we would have seen Oh, we would have seen public art sculptures on the side of, of a dual carriageway. Um, we've moved away from that, thankfully, to a much more um, engaged understanding of what public art looks like. So if it is that there's a um, public housing project being built in a particular community, then, um, that, that the local authority, if they're uh, uh, building the local um, uh, housing project, that they will initiate and develop programmes whereby artists are working with the community, maybe um, commissioning a particular piece of theatre or writing. Or So it's much more uh, socially engaged practice and much more participatory than it would have been heretofore, which would have been literally the piece of, of sculpture, as I said, on the side of the road or in the schoolyard. Um, and in, in the last six months, our minister increased the level for the percent for art. So it's not a, a percentage of the overall spend on the infrastructure programme, but it is now up to almost 100,000. Um, and part of that then for us is that that allows an artist quite a significant fee to develop an artistic programme that is tied into an, in a public infrastructure programme. So we have a huge public um, building programme happening in Ireland at the moment, particularly in relation to um, schools and hospitals. Uh, we have a, a, pro, a programme called Project 2040, Ireland 2040, um, and that's a major um, uh, public infrastructure programme. And our role as the Arts Office, or the Arts Council, is to ensure that the arts piece, the percent for arts piece is being called down because it hasn't always happened. So you have public infrastructure projects that are happening, new, as I say, social housing, or it could be a hospital, or it could be some kind of community buildings that are being built. And th there is a percentage that is there for an arts project or an arts commission that wasn't being called down. So the government have come to us as the Arts Council and said, can you take responsibility so that every single public building project that happens in Ireland over the next 10 years, that the, the, the percent for the artistic project and the artistic spend that should come from that is happening and that you're working across every government department because every government department be it the department of health department of education and um, department of local government they're all involved in public infrastructure programs and if there is a percentage of that overall building project that should be allocated to the arts so that an artist and a community can can get the benefit from it then that's really important to us so yes so so we have been tasked by the government to take responsibility for that and ensure that it's happening because it's lost money to the arts. Um, so again, when you ask the question how much money in terms of overall spend is put into the arts, there are initiatives like this that are not being exploited to, to, to maximum um, effect. So that is our role now and we've been asked in the last six months to take a much more proactive role across government in relation to it in that kind of transversal piece. Okay. Um, and just on that, um, uh, what would you say has been the, uh, the problem in the past for not all of the money being drawn down? And what's been the logjam? Um, I would say that government departments didn't know about it. Okay. So they, don't, they, they, wouldn't, they, they didn't know about it. Um, or if, you know, say there's a school being built, that the school principal wouldn't actually have known anything about it. 
So our role now is to ensure that we put together an inventory of all public um, infrastructure projects that are happening on an annual basis or you know, over the next five years, plotting them out and then ensuring that we're working with whoever it is that is the commissioner in effect of the, the building project to ensure that they are calling it down. People didn't know about it. So. Okay. Okay. Agnieszka? Th th there isn't really a direct answer to that question, but I think the, the closest would be that it is the Creative Europe that looks after uh, European capitals of culture. And I think in, in that respect, those structural effects on those cities and communities would be seen most prominently because these are, these are ultimately the infrastructure projects with really limited amount of European funding going into it. And multiple benefits and long-lasting benefits structurally changing the communities for in a, in a rather irre irreversible way. It's not quite comparing like for like, but I think the closest we've got to compare with that scheme would be, would be capitals of culture. And then also in a range of cooperation projects is the main sort of currency of the culture sub-programme of Creative Europe. And some of them would have more emphasis on this sort of social... Um, impacts that they have in, in communities, working with local authorities and um, affecting change there. So you will see those elements in some of the some of the projects. Like, for example, there's a there's a project called In Situ, which is about public, which is about creative practice in public spaces, um, not necessarily in conventional venues, but it's about art coming out to communities. And the um, project is um, designed to be a cooperation, an international cooperation of several organisations that have that same aim to get the art out into communities. I hope it answers your question. That's, um, I know certainly um, uh, that there are various uh, types of this uh, percentage of art project uh, in operation in, in some of the EU nations. Uh, certainly in France, the, the first iteration of it was in, from 1951, mm -hmm. uh, then it was amended in 1972. Um, uh, in your opinion, has it been uh, a successful uh, introduction uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of some type of public policy to, uh, to encourage more people to get involved in that, uh, as well as uh, helping local communities? I don't know if we can talk about success yet. From the European Union's point of view, culture altogether is a newer competence. That, that has has kind of caught up with everything else that the European Union does more recently. We've just had a new European Agenda for Culture launched last May, May 2018. And I think maybe a reflection of what, what, what you're talking about is in the, there are, there are three dimensions of European Agenda for Culture. And the first one is the social one. It's about making, um, communities and societies in the union more inclusive. And that's the role of culture that can actually get us there. So we will have happier, more inclusive, more tolerant uh, societies. So I would see that from, from European Union's point of view, there will be more and more emphasis on how culture can actually get us there to solve quite serious societal issues. That will certainly be on the, on the increase and member states will respond to that. Uh, just uh, and one final question. In terms of the, uh, the suggestion uh, for a percentage for our scheme, uh, I know certainly within my constituency, um, so the, the project I mentioned earlier, Big Arts, uh, they were involved uh, with a, a regeneration uh, of a particular part of Greenock. And uh, that whole area, uh, some 50, over £50 million pounds was spent uh, uh, in an area that really had no investment for some 30, 40 years. Uh, but the cultural element um, that, that they introduced actually helped come back to your point there uh, regarding the, the social element. Now, obviously, well, so that was done without a percentage for our scheme. But uh, if that type of scheme was in operation, um, is that something that you think uh, or believe could be rolled out across uh, all the housing associations and housing providers um, across Scotland to ensure that, that, the, that the cultural and the social element uh, is actually it grows and then strengthens the communities. Undoubtedly, and I think also it, it if you 
so you, you, you cite Greenock, I cite um, Ballymun in Dublin, which was an area of incredible disadvantage. Um, uh, high towers were built in the 1960s, um, and by the 1990s, um, the uh, antisocial behaviour, the drugs problems, the, it was just... Uh, and, and the decision was made at, 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 at a city council level to demolish the, the, to demolish the, sky, the, the blocks of flats and actually to introduce um, a new form of housing. And in doing that, they actually, as part of the regeneration programme, they brought in the Percent for Art piece. So all of a sudden you had artists, town planners, community activists working together to plot and plan what Ballymun might look like um, and what a new Ballymun would look like. So that that sense of active citizen participation was embedded in the planning for the local area from the outset. As part of it, the, the local people wanted an art centre. They want, So all of a sudden they began to articulate what would be important, mostly for their children and for the next generation. And now we have an area where you, you have, you know, you have a whole, I mean, there's a whole new public housing, um, a public housing uh, scheme in place, but you have now an embedded arts infrastructure. You have artists, not only do you have an art centre and you have artistic organisations based there, but actually you have artists living and working there and they're as embedded in the community as everyone else. So it was quite a transformative, and it has been, it has been, I mean, it's too early to say it's only 10 years, 12 years, but it had quite a transformative effect in terms of the local community. And if you go to it now, just that sense of, of, of pride and ownership, um, which didn't exist um, in the 1980s and the 1990s is now there. So I absolutely do genuinely believe in the, the transformative power of the arts. But it has to be it has to be aligned to um, a democratic process that the citizens are involved in planning what their place will look like. That has to happen. It cannot be ordained on a community. It has to come from the community. Could I add an example, which is which is not 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 exactly about regeneration, but another very important issue of of climate change. So there's, a, there's an international project that is supported by Creative Europe where Creative Carbon Scotland is a partner and it is about cultural adaptations. It's, it's, it's four pairings in four countries of cultural organisations and adaptation organisations that are usually linked to local authorities where artists have been asked to contribute to the debate about climate change in local communities and offer new thinking, new ideas, new uh, perspectives. Um, as it happens across four countries, there are obviously also learnings from one country to another. And there's actually going to be an international conference in Scotland held next year in 2020 with support from the Scottish government to gather and accumulate all the learnings from, from that project. So in, in, in that sense, it's, it's the same theme about giving artists the voice to actually help find solutions to serious and important societal issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I ask about the issue of data gathering, please, um, which I'm sure you'll recognise um, as a challenge that it's difficult to find accessible data showing the full picture of arts funding both nationally and locally. Um, in Scotland, uh, this committee uh, was told that as a result, individual artists and organisations have to demonstrate uh, the impact and outcome of arts funding. Um, so can I ask you both, uh, firstly, Orla, how does the Arts Council gather and analyse data to inform um, sort of evidence-based policy making? So this is, so when I talked about us changing mm. utterly how we do our business, this was one of the areas that mm. we wanted to really look at metrics and we wanted to look at measurement and we wanted to introduce a measurement framework that, that we could then tell that story in terms of, 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 of uh, telling back to government the impact of their investment in us and then our investment in artists and organisations. Um, it would be fair to say, and I think we're no different to any other arts council um, uh, in the, around the world, organisations hate providing data and information. They hate it. They find it a distraction from their core business, which is to make and create art. The process of 
um, persuasion and demonstration of how important data is for us so that they in turn must provide it to us has been a difficult enough uh, journey. Um, so they find having, you know, so we changed utterly how they apply for money. So they have to provide data at the beginning of the process and then data at the end of the process. So it's, you know, how they forecast and then the actual. So how many people attended uh, and how many um, venues did they, how many artists did they employ, all of that data. We then ask them to, to verify it at the end and say what the actual was. They despise it. We have to tie it into their funding that they won't get their final tranche of money unless they have provided the data. So it is not an easy thing um, for organisations. So it has been a process of um, transition for both them and us in terms of, of, of getting into the discipline of providing information and providing that kind of data. Now that we have it, um, and um, uh, this is probably the second year that we can actually begin to tell government the real story in terms of the impact of the investment so we can clearly demonstrate the metrics that um, so how many where what when but they're all the output pieces the impact pieces are the most difficult and um, so how do you track the impact of investment it's not just about how many artists were employed and how many people participated it's the impact piece that we're most interested in and that takes more time so we we're, we're using a social impact model um, and we've identified a number of particular projects or a number of particular areas and over a more longitudinal basis we're looking at well what is the impact um, over a period of time on a particular community or a particular demographic of Arts Council investment in a particular organisation. That piece is more difficult, and that piece we can't do on our own. Um, but the output piece, in terms of that very accessible data, the, the who, what, where, all of that, that, that is much easier to, um, to, to, to use and to, 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 um, to, to show and to demonstrate. But, but as I say, it has been hard fought in terms of getting organisations to, to provide it. They find, you know, we, 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 people say we're becoming too bureaucratic, um, that it used to be lighter touch. We just get the money and we go off and do whatever we wanted. And we tell you that it was a wonderful production or, you know, it wasn't a wonderful production. Now you're asking us how many people came, how many artists were employed, how much did you pay the artists? And, and, and so we're getting... Um, you know, the shouting from the galleries now is the Arts Council is becoming too bureaucratic, it's becoming too too tied into metrics, etc. So it's a really difficult one to balance. Um, can I um, ask Agnieszka the same question? I mean, how, how does Creative Europe gather and analyse data? So I've got a bit of prospective good news for the arts. Um, part of Creative Europe and, and even better news for the other parts of Creative Europe, because um, Creative Europe is really several programs in one. Mainly it is an, a marriage of two previous independent programs, one for screen sector called the media program, and the one for cultural sector, which used to be the culture program. So in the media program, we already from the 90s have something called um, European Audiovisual Observatory, which is the sort of research and statistics body that collects very useful data for the screen sector for over 20 years now. And it's very useful and that absolutely helps to inform policy and is indispensable too. Apart from very sort of bread and butter, several databases that they run on major metrics in, in the screen sector, they also churn out one after another very insightful reports on, I don't know, gender parity or on international performance of screen works beyond Europe. It's a continuous work that is happening in screen sector. That does not really exist for cultural sector. And before the proposals for the new incarnation of Creative Europe were published, that's where I would stop. But now I can tell, and I'm very pleased to say that, that it's foreseen for the new, for the successor of the of the current Creative Europe that will commence in 2021, it is foreseen that a similar observatory will be set up for the cultural sector. So I'm sure it will not, you know, be fully operational and have all the data from the start, but at least the data will start getting collected in a very systematic way, 
using the model of that observatory from the, from the screen sector. In addition to that, there's a lot of information that goes through the application process. That's, there's a lot of data collected through this. But we are very aware because of the financial resources, this is not representation of the sector. Not everybody applies and even fewer people are successful. So there's some kind of reading of, 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 of data that comes from the applications, but that's not representative of the European cultural sector. Another um, mechanism that looks at the data would be quite um, quite a sturdy system of midterm and final evaluations of Creative Europe, where there's a reflection whether the program is relevant and is delivering. So these are hefty reports that are produced in, at the European Commission and they are also based on data, but I think on cultural sector, as I say, there's no place to go to, so there might be more general statistics that are produced by Eurostat or other places. But it's yet in the future that we will have our own data collection mechanism. Uh, and I take it that new observatory will look at all the arts uh, across, the, across the piece. And creative uh, industries. And creative industries across all the member states. So that sounds like a mammoth task. All, all participating countries. Right. Member states are 28, whereas participating countries spill beyond EU 28. Yes, that's the ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Kavir. Okay, I've got a very quick supplementary from Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Um, and the notes that we have, it explains that Ireland does have a cultural observatory. Is that correct? Or, and how does that interact with the data collection that you're, you've spoken our, about? Our data collection is purely as it relates to our funding. Uh -huh. yeah, so right, ours, but, but you do have a cultural observatory in Ireland? Yes, yeah, yes. You do. Yeah. Right. But ours is, ours is purely about Arts Council funding. So we can demonstrate for 80 million of taxpayers' money X number of people participated and in X number And do you give information to the cultural and we give, observatory? And we give information to our department, yes. And they right, yes. get into that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, uh, Mike. Uh, just following on that very point, um, it's interesting that you're focused on, and that could be quite natural, getting this data collection from the organisations which you fund. And so you were, you were talking about actually how they're almost resented to some extent because mm -hmm. they're now having to give all of these statistics. But surely there is another impact, especially in this day and age when the general public, you know, you have to justify mm -hmm. government spending yes. to the general public, to the taxpayer. Absolutely. Do you at all um, sample or get companies to question representative samples of the public as to how arts funding has impacted upon them, rather than going through the organisations that you fund? I mean, you have to do that. Mm -hmm. But what about impact assessments in the general public. Have you, have, you, have you done any of that? No, we have. I mean, other than the, the, the annual survey, mm -hmm. which, is, which, which is a sample of the general public and asking them about their, uh, it's about their, it's both so their behaviour, it, right. okay. because it's, it's not just a participation survey, it's, it's questioning people about their behaviour and their attitudes towards the arts, as well as their participation. Right. So that's why we call it behaviour and attitudes survey rather than just a participation survey. And this is part of a national survey? And that's part time? of a national survey, yes. So but you don't do any specific... We don't specifically survey members of the public. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, part we, we have a national survey, and as part of that, then you get the information we get the that. information okay. on the behaviour and attitudes towards the arts, as well as participation levels. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Annabelle Ewing. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, <coughs> returning to the issue of peer review, um, you may be aware that in Scotland, the former Scottish Arts Council had a system of peer review, and then under the, the new, well, new, it's not new, new, but um, the subsequent arrangements under Creative Scotland, uh, that is not currently the position. In the evidence sessions that we have had and the written submissions we have received, it does seem that there is popular support for some form of peer review. So really I wanted to focus on, on the experiences of both the Arts Council in Ireland and uh, yourself uh, in the desk, the Creative Europe desk. And starting first perhaps with Orla, I understand that in, in Ireland with the Arts Council that um, whilst there is an extensive uh, peer review panel system, nonetheless, it is the Arts Council of Ireland that uh, has a sort of strategic um, uh, decision-making process in terms of the overall funding. I just wonder, how does that actually work in practice? Because on the one hand, you've got your peer review, but I think that 
you retain leadership for over uh, 100 um, uh, cases, for 100 clients. So how does that actually work? Is so there a tension will... between the two approaches? No, no? There, there's absolutely no tension. So, um, so the council retains um, the decision making as it relates to organisations. Um, because we recognise that organisations, it's not just about an idea they have one year and they pop up and they apply to us and then they may dissolve the next year. We have a long-term relationship with those organisations. There are partners in terms of supporting delivery of our strategy. Um, so they may have a not a great year, but that doesn't mean to say we're not, we're not going to fund them this year because they hadn't a great year last year. So we retain our funding to organisations um, because we see them as strategic partners. Whereas our funding to uh, for individual projects, once-off projects, or funding to individual artists, that's all done by peer panels because we recognise it's only about the idea. So it is that they are making decisions and allocating resources based on a particular artistic project or a particular artist that wants to take time to pursue their practice. So it's, it's in that moment. Whereas when you're making a decision about an organisation, it's based on the, the, the history of the organisation, the strategic importance of the organisation, how they're supporting delivery of the particular art form, or it might be supporting work with children and young people or work with, with hard to reach <coughs> communities. So it's much more complex. Um, so to, to, to give that to a panel, um, we think would be that that would actually probably destabilise the infrastructure in Ireland. Whereas panels making decisions around particular projects or particular individual artists, um, we think that that's the best fit. Um, and and we would have probably about 60 or 80, 60, 70 panels meeting on an annual basis across art form um, and for different projects. So, sorry, did you say 60 to 60, 70? Yeah, or okay. 70 panels. Um, because you might have bursaries, mm -hmm. and you could have 10 bursaries because you'd have visual arts bursaries, music mm -hmm. bursaries, theatre bursaries, opera bursaries. So it's right across mm -hmm. all of the art forms. Uh, so yes, so we have a huge number of panels that are happening on an annual basis. Um, but okay. we think it's a really effective way mm -hmm. of ensuring that the sector also can see... Um, when people participate in panels, they come away and they say it's a very fair process, it's a very open process, and they, uh, you know, it's a very transparent process. Um, so, so from the Arts Council's perspective, it also reinforces our relationship with the sector that they can see how the internal um, mechanics of decision making actually happen. And those decisions are delegated to panels. Um, the Council cannot overturn the decision of a panel. Okay. If you bring people in to make decisions, you have to respect the decisions of that 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 group of people. So we we don't mm. we, we can we will never um, overturn the decisions of a peer panel. Okay, before I'm getting on to sp some specific uh, brief questions about the actual mechanics of the arrangements in place, because I think that would be of interest if we're looking yeah. to see if if this is what we feel is the best thing to do in Scotland, how actually we'd go yeah. about it. But just when you, you, you referred there to 60 to 70 panels, the first thing I thought was, how on earth does any timeless decision ever get made? I mean, how does that actually work? Because, you, you know, the panel is there to decide on a particular application, mm. and it, there's 60 to 70 panels per annum. How, how does that all work? That's, <coughs> I mean, presumably a lot of sifting has to be done, uh, and um, there's a lot of activity going on. So how quickly would one expect if you were... Applying to a sixteen for weeks. An, as an artist, sixteen bit, weeks, sixteen weeks from date of application okay. to being informed, and that all works. And that swimmingly. all works because it's it's a machine that's right. Okay. You know, so you might have three panels meeting or four panels meeting in a day okay. to decide on bursaries or you know. So um, and it's sixteen weeks. Okay. And in that regard, then, in terms of because a point that was forcibly made, and we referred to this um, chap quite a lot. Uh, in Everton session, a jazz musician who felt, you know, the whole system was pretty poor as far as he was concerned because people were making decisions about anything he was seeking to do and they'd absolutely no, not one iota of knowledge about the jazz world or anything to do with it and he just felt that that wasn't working. So in terms of the, you, you've already said that you have, each art form has its own yes. panel. Um, in terms of the membership of that panel, how, how does that work? Do you invite people on? Is there, what's the kind of size, the average size of the panel? How does it all work in practice? Okay, so um, 
So we have a panel system where we put a call out and people apply to be a member of our panels. So we have, so let's take music for example. Um, so we might have 60, 70 people who have self-nominated to be members of our panel and we have cleared them and we know that they have sufficient uh, expertise. Um, but they'll be across genre. So you might have people, as, you know, in that 60 people, you might have people who come from classical music, you might have people who come from jazz, people who come from new music, people who come from traditional music. So then we put our call out and we receive, I don't know, 200 applications for, uh, for a music project. And when we, we shortlist them, mm -hmm. so our internal staff shortlist them, so 100 applications goes down to 70. And in the 70 applications, there'll be five from classical music, there'll be eight from jazz, there'll be seven from new contemporary music. So in looking at the, um, the profile of the applications um, that have been shortlisted, we will then um, assemble a panel that will ensure that there's expertise okay. across all of the genre. Because you can't have five people on a panel uh, that are all coming from a classical mm. perspective and then you've got people from contemporary music or you've got people from jazz. So, so the profile of the shortlisted applications will determine the makeup of the panel. The number of applications will determine the number of people on the panel. So we have, we have, we have, um, so if there are less than 20 applications, you will have three members of the panel. If there are more than 20 and less than 40, you will have four members on a panel. If you've got more than 40, there will be five. So to ensure that any conflicts of interest that are picked up can be dealt with and that there's still sufficient expertise around the table because people have to absent themselves if they're in any way conflicted. Mm. If people... So when then the, the panel, and I might be going into too much detail, but when the panel members are selected, they will get a list of the applications, not, they won't receive the applications, they'll get a list of the applications, um, and um, they will then see if they're conflicted. Mm -hmm. And if they're conflicted, and if there are too many conflicts, and we have a kind of a, a statistical, mm -hmm. a ratio piece, then they'll be asked to, to, to withdraw from the panel if they have too many conflicts. If they only have one conflict and there are 50 applications, mm -hmm. we'll say, OK, that can be managed within the process. They'll absent themselves. And then they all get access mm -hmm. online to a portal whereby they can they read through all of the applications um, they can, and all of the, sub, uh, the supporting material. And then they come in on the day and each panel is chaired by either a member of the current Arts Council or a, a former member of the council. Okay. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to hear how all that, uh, th that quite significant uh, degree of, of machinery, if you like, which is in place, uh, is, is working well in practice. It, I, I take it then that it seems to me, from what you've said, um, Broadbrush, that actually there's a lot of buy-in to this approach because it seems you have a pool of very interested, willing members who want to be involved in this. Yes. Uh, and there's buy-in, and I presume, therefore, that means that at the other end, in terms of the... The, the applicants that there is support for this approach is this yes and that this might and, and, and that might um, that might be one of the reasons why we have so many applications mm. that people know that it is you believe um, it's fair that it's a fair yeah. and robust it's not perfect yeah. you know and yeah. we're constantly reviewing it and you know about four years ago we did a huge job on co managing conflicts mm. and that ratio mm. piece and you know so we're constantly mm. reviewing it um, but it does work and it has worked and we we where other arts councils may have had it and then um, and, and then they ceased to use it for a range of strategic mm -hmm. reasons. I mean, there were moments where we considered, is this, will we continue with peer panels or not? And we did. So I suppose in continuing with it, it has existed for so long now that the machine is just, yeah, the, it's, it's just there. Uh, and last question for her and then I'll get on to Nisha, if that's okay. Um, so in terms of um, the, the membership of the panel, does that then automatically include sort of high level, you know, successful absolutely. artists as well yes, as, absolutely. you know, your ordinary person wanting to participate in Yes, in absolutely. Um, you know, so you might have a Cullum to Bean sitting on a panel. Mm -hmm. I mean, last year in our literature, bur two years in our literature bursaries, uh, Edna O'Brien applied for mm -hmm. and received a bursary for her most recent book oh, okay. on um, uh, Boko Haram. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, absolutely. Um, 
and 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 they it, it works it works well but there is a huge amount there's a huge operations team mm. that are focused entirely on um on ensuring that the, mm. the the panels operate and 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 work and then anyone who sits on a panel receives you know they receive a fee for mm -hmm. sitting on the panel and then they receive a fee for all of the preparation work and the reviewing of all of the applications in advance um because we have, you know, I mean, mm. most of them are individual artists, etc. So, um, so yeah. So that leads to one final question for you on budgetary issues. Then, so what kind of percentage of your budget is spent on this machinery? Then, if we were seeking to introduce machinery, we would need to have an idea of, you know, is it worth it in terms of cost, the benefits, etc. So. I mean, we don't we, we don't see the the fee piece as being that huge, you know, because we see it as another way of us supporting individuals and and, and artists. And um, so it is. There's a team of four whole time equivalents that are working servicing the the, the, the committees. But we see that just in terms of the long term, in terms of our relationship with the sector, mm -hmm. um, as much as anything, that it's it's money well well spent really. Good. Oh, fascinating. Um, Anisha, what about, uh, from your perspective, how does peer review play a role in, in the work that... Okay, so, so the first at? caveat is that I cannot speak so confidently <laughs> about this as Orla can, because it is not the desk's competence sure. to be directly yeah. involved in that, but we are obviously told and informed mm -hmm. how, how it works in Brussels. So the system is pretty much the same, except it's for... 41 countries. So on the outset of one edition of the programme, which is usually seven years span, there's an, there's an opening of a database where people can self-nominate as experts and there's a huge pool of people with expertise in different areas of cultural sector who are then uh, assessed for their expertise and selected by people who process applications in, at the agency and those experts are being used. There's, a, there's an effort we are being told, it's all very anecdotal, we just get to hear about this, that obviously there's, a, there's an effort to use rota systems, so it's not that, so there's a great variety of voices amongst the experts. Every application gets at least two uh, experts, and mostly the ambition is that one expert would be from the country that the application has come from, whereas the other expert will be not. So they will give it this external mm. optics, whether really the project that is meant to be international really responds and resonates in that way. Experts are paid fees, and this is part of the kind of overheads bill of the, of the program. They're quite modest fees, but it's a similar principle that we are all, there's this peer quality about this that we all kind of look at each other's projects and help each other select the best. Um, what I what I would like to stress though is that it's it's quite transparent that starting from the published guidelines for the for the different types of support, there's there's a kind of unified system of a hundred points that any project can score. And those hundred points are sort of divvied up uh, across several priorities and objectives that the projects have to score against. So it's not so much about the expert's sort of taste or personal view, but they're very much bound to what the objectives and priorities of the program mm. are. They have very neatly designed experts' guides that they have to literally tick against boxes whether each application responds to this priority, to what extent, and in the end, applications score a number of points. That system has kind of, you know, enthusiasts and, and critics, mm -hmm. but that's, that's how it works with, with Creative Europe, that at the end of the assessment process, every application ends up with a number mm -hmm. attached to it. Now, we, 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 we do suffer from, um, in a good sense, from, um, the, the Creative uh, Europe's culture subprogram in particular being very much in demand with very limited resources. So the success rates are quite low. There's lots of applications that mm. come in. And beyond this individual assessment that happens all over the continent, there's a big job then to try mm. and coordinate somehow uh, which projects should eventually get selected. So obviously the point system helps a great deal because a lot of them go to one side, but then there's this sort of 
exciting area where it could <laughs> be this way or the other. Uh, the, and, and those projects get the attention of a panel again, which would look not only about at the individual application in their own right, but at, at the mix. Because again, we have to look after many different areas in the, in the cultural sector. So you don't want to end up with this year our projects being heritage or this year our projects being performing arts. So, so that will be the added value of the panel looking at the mm -hmm. more or less good split between different areas. I think that's... that's so just, I mean, just right. one last question, if I may. So it just... Uh, the, yeah. As possible. Just, oh, I'm just, sorry. Sorry, sorry yeah. no, just a very brief uh, follow-up. So, in terms of the, the waiting to the the, the, the the final panel that looks, you know, at the, the various uh, points uh, coming through in terms of the applications, um, to what extent then, in addition, is there a, 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 a consideration um, of the, the geographic spread across the EU that has to be taken into consideration? Okay. But really, to be honest, in, in, in the cooperation projects, you will always have a mix already within each project. So there's, there's less of a worry that some part of Europe would not be involved because okay. they're, they're beautifully the diverse first, just, yeah. in, inside. Mm. <laughs> OK, thank you. It's very interesting. Thank OK, you thank you, Rose Greer. Thanks, Convener. Um, I'd like to go back to some... Oro touched on it quite a bit in relation to um, housing regeneration infrastructure, but how... Um, arts funding and, and how uh, the Arts Council um, interacts with other areas. Um, I'm particularly interested uh, around education and your, your level of interaction uh, with primary and secondary education in particular and what level that primarily happens at. I don't know if, you, if you'd be able to detail a little bit where the integration happens there. Um, we have a programme called Creative Schools. Uh, which is a partnership between the Department of Education, the Arts Council and the Department of Culture. Um, and that's run across all schools, so primary schools, secondary schools, youth reach centres, uh, special schools um, and Irish language uh, schools in the Gaeltacht and Irish language um, schools. Uh, and that is probably the most... Um, uh, the most public manifestation of our relationship with the Department of Education. So that is a programme that is rolled out um, nationally, not in every school because it's quite a costly programme, um, uh, but it, um, it sees each school that is part of the programme uh, developing a creative plan for the school. Um, and they work with, we assign to every school a creative associate. And that associate works with the school community, be it the teachers, the young people, um, and the community in which the school um, operates, to develop a plan for that school that speaks to the local colour, really. Um, so if there's an art centre, if there's a, you know, a, a, a theatre in the local community, that, that that speaks to it, or if there are artists that are particularly um, interested in music that are living in that local community, that you're harnessing the local heat, in effect. Um, so that is probably the most um, significant programme that we have working with, um, working with schools, the Creative, uh, the creative Schools programme. Um, and as I say, each school is assigned a creative associate that works with that school and in that school on an annual basis. The other then would be our, our um, um, and these are devolved out to organisations, um, but we would have the Writers in Schools programme and Artists in Schools programme. So Poetry Ireland uh, is a, a national organisation, works both north and south, and they would operate our uh, Writers in Schools programme. So we would have 80 to 100 writers that are out in schools working on an annual basis, and then the same would exist for uh, artists in schools as well. So those would be, an, be examples of, and then obviously, individual organisations would have particular programmes in schools and local authorities would have quite developed programmes that we would support through our direct funding to local authorities that would, that, that would um, engage with the schools in their local, um, their local authority area. Thank you. Really useful. Just on the, the Creative Schools programme, because that sounds really interesting, um, could you detail a little bit who the Creative Associates are, but also you said due to the, the cost of the programme, it's not something that's rolled out in every school. If you could maybe explain a little bit um, wh which schools it is rolled out in and why, and is that to do with the local authorities you work with or, or some other criteria? Um, so the, the Creative Associates are um, a mixture of both teachers and artists. 
Um, so, and they, they apply to us to be associates. And we like to have that mix between teachers who are, are identifying as artists and artists who want to identify as, as not a teacher, but they're interested in that pedagogical piece. Um, so we have, so the creative associates are a, a mixture of both. Um, and that works really well. Um, artists going into schools, but also then teacher artists going into schools. Um, in terms of uh, na the, the programme being national and how do we select the schools, obviously, again, it's demand versus, you know, or schools make applications. And then we have quite a, 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 a complex um, uh, a method of selection whereby each county has to have, have schools within the county that are part of the programme. We have a mixture between primary schools and secondary schools, we, you know, and then we, we have a mixture of schools in more disadvantaged communities and, and rural communities. So it's a really complex matrix that, that we use um, uh, to, to actually select the schools. Um, but it ensures that because you know, it's not the best school over the, you know, so it's not, oh, they're the best school, so we're going to to to, to, uh, to um, select them. So it has to be done in a more spatial and uh, a spatial way, um, as well as a, a kind of a more, uh, yeah, so, so it's complex, but it's ensuring that every county, every profile, every type of school is, is part of the programme. How long has the Creative Schools programme been running for? Uh, this is its third year, right. so it's young enough. So in that case, I'm actually quite interested in how that came about. I think our experience here is, is often to, to get that level of integration. Um, what we sometimes end up with is uh, there is the education stream and cultural projects are bolted on. So it's not, it's not a genuine collaboration between the relevant folk from education and culture. It's the folk in education, delivering education, and this is bolted on to the side. So I'm interested in how this came about. Was this something that you or uh, the culture department had to approach the Department of Education about, or was it collaborative? So uh, the, the, what you, you describe would be um, uh, familiar to us all in terms of trying to work with Department of Education who very much see that's what they do and if you want to do something you'll graft it on but you'll not in any way um, interrupt or, or, or change what we do. So that has always been the way with us um, uh, in, in, in the Republic of Ireland. And then in 2016 um, we had a huge uh, commemoration programme to mark um, uh, the um, a hundred years since the Easter Rising, um, and the, one of the biggest the legacy programs that came out of that was how schools became involved, and they young people um, told stories about 1916, about the revolution, um, but did it in really interesting ways with artists in their own local communities and in their own schools. And people, the, the whole country was just transfixed, really, by uh, by young people owning a story that was a hundred years old and retelling it uh, in a real in really exciting ways. Um, and the state. Uh, the government, as part of that, decided that, that there was something really special that happened in Ireland in, in 2016 and that we needed to capitalise on it. And what had happened was clearly um, within the world of culture and the arts and that creative space. So the government established what we call Creative Ireland, uh, which, is a, which is a policy across government that places the arts and culture at the centre of what we do as, as, as a state. So that every department, be it the Department of Health, the Department of Education, obviously the Department of Culture, but that, that they look at, at policy making through the lens of culture. Um, so that enabled us and gave us the permission slip in a way to sit down in a very different way that with the Department of Education and say, well, look, is there a way in which we can embed culture and creativity into education that will not, because their whole thing is leave the curriculum, that's ours. And that's always been this kind of defensive. And it's about saying, actually, creativity embedded in how we teach, how young people learn, will actually create a new generation. A ne the next generation will be a different type of generation of, of young Irish people. So how do we embed this um, way of thinking, way of teaching, way of learning? Um, how do we embed that in, 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 the, in the system? So that uh, both in terms of how we train teachers, 
because they're going to be in classrooms for 40 odd years. So the big thing for us was getting into teacher training and teaching and, and teaching them differently from the beginning so that when they went into a classroom, they had 40 years of, of teaching generations of young people where we were teaching them differently. And then the other part was the creative schools. So we, and it was an open door really because the government policy had already been set. So then it was really easy for us to sit down and plot out with the Department of Education how might we embed creative thinking, in effect, is what it is, um, and the arts into schools in a very different way. So rather than, as you say, you know, you, 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 you attach on a programme to what's happening already in school, this is about actually getting into the foundations um, and, and, and changing the way in which, which business is done in schools. Thank you. That's very useful. Thanks very much. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Ola. You spoke about earlier about the plan that you have uh, within local authorities, the, the cultural plan. You have the, the director of culture and you have the officers. So, so can I ask, have many of the local authorities, as has happened here uh, in Scotland, got involved with the ALIO, the arm's length uh, organisations that look after some of the cultural uh, facilities within local authorities? Uh, that might be the theatre or the, uh, mm -hmm. the concert hall or the, uh, the museums that, that, that fall into part of that. And if that is the case, uh, how do the posts uh, that are, you have within local authority uh, and the plans that are based, how do they work together to ensure that there is that, that meeting of ensuring that the cultural plan and the cultural identity is, is captured? So in every local authority, there would also be an art centre. In some local authority areas, there might be two, but one of them will be a local authority run and supported art centre. So that is separate to the work of the, the officer or the director of culture. Okay. That is about ensuring that there is infrastructure provision at a local level that has been provided by the local authority so the people in local communities can access the arts. Um, and those, in, there are different models that are used by local authorities. Some, all of the staff working in that arts centre would be local authority employees. Yep. In others, they set up spe special purpose vehicles yep. um, or, 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 or companies limited by guarantee. Um, but they are effectively local authority run um, they have independent staff, etc., but the lion's share of the funding to run it would come from the local authority, then with, with significant investment coming from ourselves. So they would all have responsibility for a venue in each local area. That is separate to, but augments what's happening in terms of the director of culture and the arts officer. And that's a really important mm -hmm. thing for us, yep. and we then co-fund them together. So that, that gives you the opportunity to ensure that, that, that there will be a programme across the entire uh, locations, uh, uh, and that's very important because by having the, the organisation funded by the council or, or having a stream within the council, but also uh, tapping into the outside world where you can get other sponsorship or partnership workings going on so that they can collaborate with you, uh, so that they can invest uh, and they can support uh, the plan going through uh, a number of years uh, when, when a council is going through its short-term, medium-term planning. Uh, I think that's vitally important. Yes. So, so that's great to hear that that happens. So how do you ensure that there's an equity across all of the local authorities to ensure that you get that? Uh, because that's been one of the hardest things for us to achieve here uh, when we've been looking at how that's been captured. Uh, and it would be good to see if you have a similar issue or you've managed to uh, make that work better maybe in Ireland than we do here. Well, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, so last year, this year, um, 2018 into 2019 and we completed, we did a review of art centres around, the, we call them venues, now we're calling them art centres. So we did a review with, when I spoke earlier about the umbrella organisation for local authorities in Ireland, we commissioned a joint review between ourselves and them to look at art centres around the country, to look at local infrastructure provision, to look at the different models, look at the ways in which they were funded, the ways in which they were staffed, etc. So that's the first time we've ever done that. It has to be done in partnership mm -hmm. and it has to be done very gently. Um, because there can't be any sense that we're trying to force their hand, uh, because they're, they're, you know, they're, we're, we're, we're a national agency, but they're local agencies and they're statutory agencies. So it's a very delicate dance. So by co-commissioning a report, we're now in a position to begin to look at how we will change the model in terms of, of of, of that funding piece that, you, that you've spoken about, change the model over the next number of years. The first thing we had to do is to commit 
as, as an arts council this year that we will significantly increase our funding into arts centres next year. We cannot sit across the table from local authorities and have a conversation about increased spend from their perspective if we're not doing the same. So that was the first thing that we had to do and that allows us then to start having those bigger, more strategic conversations next year because at least we have this co-commissioned report in front of us that gives us the, the analysis and gives us the evidence you can't have conversations without it, um, particularly with partners such as local government that are statutory partners. So that's how we've done it, um, and that's and, and it's not done yet. This is only year. You know, we've just commissioned the report, and now we've had to. To, to show show willing in terms of increasing our investment, and that's at the point we're at that point now. Can I ask about the bidding process that you have within your desk? Now, <coughs> how does that categorise for locations that maybe have not in the past uh, gone forward and asked for or have had a lower uptake uh, within a specific location? Uh, how does that equate? And do you try to look at those locations where they're not? Uh, getting the funding or there, or there hasn't been an uptake and try to support that mechanism to ensure they do? Yes, so um, this is where the value of our partners yeah. comes into play because the desk is quite a mix. That There are five key public organisations in, in, in cultural sphere that are all mm -hmm. around the table. So I think actually with Scotland we are in a happy place because the activity and engagement in Creative Europe is by no means limited to central belt. There's organ organizations in outer Hebrides that get creative view of money. But we did look, for example, in England, with, in collaboration with Arts Council England, that there was a project that was running within the desk to actually go out very actively after areas in England that were sort of not so switched on to the opportunity. And some sort of um, success. Um, was achieved, or even even if not so much success, but more the reasons for lesser engagement were more clearly identified than the barriers. And, and those learnings can be then shared with Arts Council, because what's really important about Creative Europe is that this is the sort of, this is the program that is not a replacement for any public funding available on local, national, regional level. It's, it's, it's meant to add value. It's made, meant to be this enhancement that gives the international dimension. So it's very useful to share those learnings uh, with, the, with the national agency and then see how that potential could be unlocked. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can I just ask very quickly, do you have a physical presence outside Dublin? No. You don't? No, we don't. OK, thanks very much. Can't afford Kenneth. <laughs> yeah, yes, thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, good morning, um, panel. Fascinating discussions over a whole range of areas this morning. I mean, first, I, was wondering, I wonder if I can ask Agnieszka. We, we've got a very detailed report looking at all the different ways in which arts are um, delivered across Europe, and it's incredible how they've evolved so divergently you know, um, over the years. It's also interesting the, 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 the way in which culture is considered so differently in many countries in terms of its priority, not just in Europe, but of course in, a, uh, in, in places like Quebec, New Zealand, etc., that, that are covered in the report. But one of the things we're grappling with in terms of this uh, inquiry is how we can obviously ensure more effective delivery of arts funding in Scotland. And I'm just wondering, given the your wide knowledge one would think of uh, European arts funding, etc. Well, we all appreciate that the probably the b biggest uh, and most important thing we could do for the arts is to deliver more money for distribution per se. Is there any kind of model, for example, that could either be adapted by Scotland or could be looked specifically at Scotland that you think could deliver most effectively for the arts? Um, obviously, Orla's sitting next to you, so you might want to give a nod to Ireland, but maybe not. I mean, where, where do you think they've actually got it right, if you uh, uh, to put well, it I that way, from, if I can, from, if I can from, put it from that way? From my point of view, where the, money goes, where the money goes is to connect people. Mm -hmm. And that is so crucially important, because the, the investment through Creative Europe really is to 
collapse borders, make people more mobile, work with each other, inspire each other, find new audiences, unlock new markets. And that is where that is that is where you can expect some investment to to come back when you open those opportunities beyond any one particular country so thanks to creative europe and its very limited resources you've got this extra layer in um a sector which is extremely vibrant in in, in every country and beautifully diverse and in all sorts of languages and historical backgrounds and all that, east, west, south, north. Um, there's this added layer where we all meet and open up and can work with each other. And that, I think, is in itself a model that complements whatever provision is uh, on, on national level. For example, for, for, for Creative Scotland, in their sort of strategy, 10-year plan, the international is one of the five priorities, right? There's, there's other four priorities. International is not the only aspect that you need to look after. Whereas Creative Europe is that added um, element that can be used to incentivize this type of activity. Just one more sentence mm. that, especially for smaller countries, that is very important because we all know there's we, we categorize countries and there's the, the big five in europe but everybody else is a smaller country that has their own <coughs> barriers and obstacles to open up and benefit from 500 million audience for anything we creatively uh, churn out so everybody's struggling in their little corners but if we come together and learn from one another we are much stronger yeah, I think I think everyone would actually I, I agree with that. I mean, without any shadow of a doubt. But if you look at a specific area of Europe and you see something that's very innovative and very, um, you know, s inspirational, is how can that be shared and help in, 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 um, across other countries in Europe? How 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 does uh, the desk connect with other countries to say, you know, look, this is what's happening in country X. Why not look at perhaps doing something similar? I mean, you, you can't impose, but you can certainly encourage others to do that. And so I'm trying to look at how we can help get a model which is more effective, delivers um, a, a, a better experience for the, the people in all of our societies, but also helps artists develop and sustain themselves. We, we, the, the, the name that we use that for that in Creative Europe is dissemination, because those, those few projects that we manage to fund, again, it's not the whole of the sector, but it is about also about learnings and values of, of those support projects to be spread much more widely into the sector. So I would like to use the example of Let's Dance, an international project where Why Dance, a Scottish organisation, is, is, is a partner. So they, they've run an international project where they were looking at young dancers of all abilities. So there's, there's disability in dance at the core of the project as well. There's a really nice presentable website where all the sort of shared uh, learnings from the project, they had workshops, they developed methodologies for how to promote greater inclusivity in dance and those methodologies are published for everyone to see and I just know of because I've been reading about it is that they are looking looked at very carefully at, by some dance companies in the United States who are learning from us how on the European level we've managed to make some gains and achieve something in, in, in that very area so a lot of that is already happening and it's true that with technology, perhaps, we could share even more what we are all learning from one another. There are uh, physical gatherings, events, forums, conferences where cultural operators come together to, um, to swap their thoughts and experiences. I'm not quite sure how we can do 
more of that, but it, it's already happening. And Orla, you talked. To, you, I mean, you, you talked earlier on about how in Ireland pre-recession there was 85 million euros, then it went down to 55. Now it's kind of went up to 80 in the last three years. Th things are a wee bit uh, have moved forward a wee bit. I mean, obviously that's a, quite a, a, a shock to the, to, the, to the system, and it obviously had an impact, an adverse impact on the the, art, the arts community. So, have you been able to? How have you been able to adapt to that in order to be able to continue to deliver um, uh, the kind of services that you want to do to encourage more people to, to come forward and to try and um, have a life in the arts, so to speak, w with these kind of pressures? And the, and the question I asked originally was, is there anywhere you would look to in Europe to say, you know, that is really where we could be, or, or further afield, where, where we could emulate, uh, um, but you've not quite been able to do so yet? Well, in response to your first question, which is, you know, how did we adapt? Um, in the first year or two, we were in crisis management mode in a way. You know, the, the funding had collapsed completely. We lost about a third of our funding. Um, and in the first few years, we just kept the show on the road, but everybody got a bit less. But everybody still continued to get funding, but everybody got a bit less. And what we realised quite quickly was that actually, and I spoke about it earlier, we needed a, a fundamental shift. Because, you know, we could cut everybody a little bit every year. An art centre could literally keep the lights on, but they couldn't put anything on the stage, they couldn't put anything on the walls, they wouldn't be able to programme. That's actually not an effective use of public monies. We're an arts council. Um, we have to be able to fund the making and the creating of work. So therefore, we fundamentally shifted who and what we funded. Um, so we did cease to fund many organisations, and in some organisations we funded them more, to do more. Um, uh, and there are many organisations that do not exist now in 2019 in Ireland that it did exist 10 years ago. So that's the reality of both the recession, but also a fundamental shift for us in terms of, of what we do and how we do it. Because as part of that, our, our new strategy emerged, which very clearly laid out our priorities in terms of the artists and public engagement. And if you weren't able to lock yourself in as an organisation to the priorities of the Arts Council, then we, we cease to fund you. Um, because we had to move away from passive funding. We had to, you know, people come to us and they, they used to say, we want to do X, Y, and Z. And we'd say, well, here's the money to do X and Y, but we can't give you enough to do Z. Without any calls on that. Um, and in a way then, it comes back to the measurement and the metrics piece. How then could we demonstrate the impact of the investment if it wasn't in some way aligned to our strategy? So that was the fundamental shift that happened. And not every organisation was match fit in a way to, 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 to work with us um, to be able to change their behaviours so that they became much more strategic in terms of what they were doing and how they do it. Um, in terms of other organisations and how other organisations do it, um, uh, Arts Council Wales is very similar to us in terms of budget um, and, 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 and we look at that. We can never look at, at England because it's just too huge and too everything. Um, Creative Scotland, there are aspects of Creative Scotland that we've always found really interesting, but it has other functions in, in terms of, of creative industries, etc., that, that, that change the nature of what they do and how they do it. Um, so Arts Council Wales would be the most similar. The other that we look to that we think it's not at a European level, but it is really similar to what we do and how we do it, um, and we've learned a huge amount from them, is Creative New Zealand. Uh, because the, 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 you know, the size of the country, etc., would be very similar, and we, we just, they're, they're really good at what they do. That's fascinating. Just one final point, if I may convene, and that's basically on the bit that Orla was talking about earlier on in terms of embedding creativity and education. Um, I mean, I, I, I take it the Irish government is expecting that not only will you be able to help um, in, uh, create more um, artistic creativity, but that will also lead to other spin-offs in terms of creativity and in other areas of, of um and actually, you know, we don't want mathematics, yeah, and whatever it happens to be. It, you know, um, it's technology. innovative thinking in yes. a way. It's creative yeah. thinking. It's thinking outside the box. It's not about creating more artists. It's about embedding that the 
how creativity helps you to think in a very different way and that's the generational shift that we want to happen rather than it being about creating more artists so it's just about about embedding you know I, I, I used to work with children and young people in theatre many many years ago and I remember working with a linguistic anthropologist and she said the thing about using drama with young people is that they begin to think well what if what if we did this in this? What if? And it's about trying to insert the what if into young people's mindsets um, so that they, they, they hopefully will achieve in ways that we can't even anticipate now in 2019. Okay, it's a nice positive ending. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks very much. But we've gone slightly over, but we've still got... I know Claire wants to ask another question and I've got a couple of things to mop up. Have you got another five minutes? Yeah. Okay, Claire. Um, it's just the inquiries about sustainable funding and so far we've talked a lot about government funding and public funding. Does Ireland have any tradition of corporate sponsorship or private sector involvement in the arts? And Anishka, if, there, if there's a European angle to that, if you do any work with independent, uh, with businesses in the private sector? So, yes, yeah, so we have uh, Business to Arts, which I think most organisations have similar, um, uh, or most countries have similar organisations that work. They're that bridge between the business sector and the arts community, um, and they're funded directly by both business and by our, our Department of Culture. Um, the Arts Council, um, in the last number of years, we have a programme called RAISE, um, and it's a private investment scheme that we work with our own organisations. Or arts organisations are, except for some of the bigger organisations like an opera or the National Theatre, arts organisations tend to be um, less experienced in the whole area of private investment, be it sponsorship or be it in philanthropic monies. Um, and, 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 and the whole arts sector in Ireland tends to be less advanced in this area. Schools or charities are much, much more expert um, than the arts sector would be. So we have a programme that we run um, that is supporting organisations. We have three bands of it. The first band is where we fund fundraisers to go into arts organisations. There are five eight of them, um, and we fund a fundraiser to go into those organisations. They're not the big blue chip National Opera or those. They're mid-scale organisations and um, we're, we're supporting fundraisers to go in over a 24-month period to support those organisations to develop fundraising strategies and develop their fundraising muscle really um, and to begin to, 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 to really increase investment and we've already seen um, the, the impact of putting a fundraiser into those organisations to work with them um, and become a member of staff. Months, you said. Yeah. Or 24 months. You put them in, yeah. But... Uh, but what is anticipated is that those um, that those roles will continue because actually part of the thing around in, in fundraising is that you fundraise your own your own salary first and then everything on top of that. So they're they're really beginning to do it. And then there are two other strands, um, two other tiers within it that are getting support. So we have a fundraising team now that's working in the Arts Council that's supporting us um, to, 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 to de deliver training um, and supports to organisations to really build their muscle in this area. But it's slow. Mm -hmm. um, and the big thing for us is it can't be terribly focused on the corporates. It has to be focused on, on a much more local, um, you know, who are the people in your local community that, that may be high net, you know, worth individuals, etc. Because there are only so many Googles and LinkedIn's and, you know, Diageo's in, in one country the size of Ireland. So it has to be scale appropriate and it has to be focused at a very different, at a different level in terms of sponsorship. But really really okay. beginning to tap into private investment. But it's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anishka, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? In well, yes. The, the, the first answer to the um, sustainability um, would be that um, really a lot of that rests on the shoulders of the applicants themselves because it's, it's really sort of quid pro quo. Tell us how your project will contribute to making the arts sector more sustainable through your activity that you're proposing, and we will give you that investment that will enable that. The expectation is that at the end of the project, the organization is stronger and is contributing to a stronger sector. I think, very crudely speaking, that's, that's the whole premise, that any applicant to Creative Europe needs to have that reflection of themselves and their space, their, their place in the sector and their sort of ambition to strive into making themselves more sustainable. We, 
Apart from a newer, um, th there's a very new now uh, mobility scheme, international mobility scheme for artists, which is a new feature of the program called iPortunus. Maybe people have heard about this. This is very new, but until now, all the money has been given out towards those cooperation projects or platforms or networks, which are really led by organizations rather than artists themselves. There's no grants for individuals through Creative Europe, but artists are very much straight. When you get delve into the projects, artists are at the core of them. However, they're managed. They are managed by cultural organizations that would be achieving those goals towards strengthening the sector and making the arts more sustainable. So that's, that's to answer first question. And second, about um, partnership with the private sector. Again, it's pretty much on the shoulders of the applicants that there's always requirement of much funding. And a lot of that comes from other public sources, but private sector is very welcome to co-finance all those projects. So organizations go out to private companies as well for sponsorship deals or other sorts of support. And with, with this premise that they have a prospect of getting European funding, they make themselves a bit stronger, I think, that they come with that proposition to operators in the private sector. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, just quickly to wrap up, um, first to Agnieszka. Um, you did describe Scotland as a happy place in terms of how um, Creative Europe's funding was working here in terms of it being rolled out particularly geographically. Um, what will be the impact on Scottish arts um, from Brexit uh, and uh, presumably the end of your funding? And is it, is it possible for a country which is not a member state to tap into Creative Europe? Okay, so here I really have to be very careful to be strictly factual because we are in the pre-election yeah. period. Um, so I've already touched on this, that the main value of the programme is to connect Scotland better to the world, um, Europe in, in particular. And that is likely to suffer if the investment in, in that diminishes. Now, in the, um, in the event of the UK having left um, the EU, what matters a lot is whether it leaves with a deal or without a deal. That's what we've been um, considering for a long time. And for the attention of the committee, there is a um, guidance page on our website, which is primarily addressed at current beneficiaries and potential applicants, which explains all the <laughs> consequences of leaving this way or the other way. If we leave with a deal, then we will enter the implementation phase, which means that our participation in this programme can be continued until the end of that edition of the programme, until the end of 2020, <coughs> which, is, which coincides with the end of the implementation phase. If we live without the deal, our status as a country changes overnight, and the day after no deal exit, we are a third country um, in the sort of um, dictionary of the EU, which means sudden loss of access to Creative Europe. Now, going to the, 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 the rules of the programme, which are written into its legal base, which is another document which is published on, on, on all, all, all websites, there, there are strictly defined rules on which countries can and which countries cannot participate in, in Creative Europe, both in current programme and in the next edition, which is already uh, quite, quite advanced in its preparation because it's supposed to be launched in 13 months' time. So the rules stipulate, first, first very important point is that the programme is not limited to participation by EU member states. Currently, there are 41 countries that take part in culture sub-programme of Creative Europe. So it is theoretically possible for um, countries that are not uh, EU members to negotiate their way into the programme. It happens on the basis of bilateral uh, negotiations where a government of a country reaches out to European Commission and negotiates the access. As the programme is funded by the EU budget, uh, those countries that co don't contribute to, to EU budget have to contribute to the programme. So what, what changes that what would be expected from the UK post exit is that it pays financial contribution. Okay. So, as a non EU member state, UK 
could possibly be a participating country if it negotiates its participation. Now, if it didn't, there's another way to still be involved and engaged because the programme allows for participation of third countries in a limited way, only as associated partners and only roughly in budgetary terms up to 30% of a project could be with a partner from, say, Thailand or Canada. But um, it is still possible uh, to, to, to be involved. So, so there are those two um, scenarios. Thank you very much. And that's very factual um, uh, summation of uh, the situation. Thank you very much. And just absolutely finally, uh, Orla, th th this, this um, inquiry was really kicked off by a bit of a, a crisis in Scotland when uh, a regular funding organisations, which is a, a three-year cycle, a number of them were not refunded and there was a bit of a stushy, as we say in Scots, uh, around it. Um, <coughs> clearly, that's something that happens uh, in all funding programmes. And I just wondered, you know, like, how, how do you avoid that? Do you avoid it? Do you experience it as well? And, and one of the, the implications of that was how do we fund, you know, like our, um, our, our art structure, our cultural structure, if you like, because some of the, the organisations that didn't get funding would have argued that we, we were really very much part of the arts infrastructure. And if you take us away or if, you, you, if we have unstable funding every three years, then you undermine the infrastructure of the arts across the country. It's really, really difficult, really difficult. And particularly with the arts, it, the arts tend to be very vocal. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and yes, it's, it's very difficult. We don't have, we have annual funding from government. So therefore we don't make very many three-year commitments. We have three-year commitments for some of our national institutions, but we would only fund probably of the 90 organisations that we fund on, a, on an annual basis, the infrastructure, the kind of the, the, the core um, ecology really, um, we would only fund about 20 to 25 of those on a three year basis. Um, so that, that, I think that changes and alters it. So everybody is funded on a year by year basis. Um, we used to fund over 300 organisations in that manner. Um, and now we're down to under 100. So you can see where the shifts and the changes happened um, in the years when we didn't have an awful lot of funding. Um, but it is really very difficult. Um, and there are, uh, what we have done is we have strategic funding and it is not an open, it's not an open, um, uh, funding scheme. People can apply, but you have to clearly demonstrate that you're core to the infrastructure. It's very hard to become core to the infrastructure one year when you weren't core to the infrastructure the previous year. So they tend to be the long-standing organisations that we have funded over many years. Um, and then everybody else applies through what we call arts grants funding. And that is much more activity-based rather than supporting the core costs associated with an organisation. Um, but uh, it is really difficult when, strate when the strategic priorities of a funding body and an organisation don't continue to align. The decisions that have to be made can be very difficult um, and people can become very vocal um, and we've experienced that, uh, really experienced that in Ireland uh, where there have been big campaigns um, against us. But if you're very clear that it's aligned to strategy, you're very clear as to the rationale that you know that, that both the council and the executive clearly follow process and that we're very confident in the decision making, then that's the decision. Um, but that's the difficult bit is then holding, hold, being true to the, the decision. Um, but it can be really difficult. And again, it is all symptomatic of being underfunded. We'd love to be able to fund everybody that is of quality that comes to the Arts Council's door, and we can't. It's the same with Creative Europe. Projects of really high quality don't get through just purely because of lack of funding. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much to both of you for an absolutely fascinating, I have to say, evidence session and for giving up your time. I know you're both very busy people and um, we very much appreciated uh, hearing your expertise on these matters. Thanks very much. And we'll now move into private session.